Hey guys, welcome back to Better From The Ground Up. Today we have special guest with us, Paul Bodenstein, and this is going to be part one of a two-part series. Well, every morning when you get up, you run up the flag, it says balance nutrition, and you salute it every morning. That's what I'm here to do today. That's my strategy. There's no magic program for everybody. It's about identifying what's most limiting and fixing it. So it's amazing what the crop can do when your nutrition is squared away and everything's good and adequate and balanced. All right, so today, guys, we are going to have guest Paul Bodenstein on here, and Paul is from Ashland, Virginia, and we have been working together for the past three years, I believe, about three years now. Yeah, hard to um, believe. Yes, so, uh, so I got introduced to Paul through David Hula, and um, after talking to him a few times on the phone, I figured uh, this guy is a lot smarter than I am, and he's been around a lot longer than me, so I probably ought to do all I can to work with him, so... Um, Paul and I started a working relationship a few years ago. He helps um, he helps me um, develop products. He helps me make recommendations to growers, and I've learned so much about agronomy in general from Paul. Um, so, um, without further ado, Paul Bodenstein is here. And uh, Paul, if you don't mind, tell everybody just a little bit about your background um, and yourself. Okay, thanks, Cody. Good to be with you. Um, my name is Paul Bodenstein. I'm here in Ashland, Virginia. We are not the rich men north of Richmond, but we are north of Richmond. <laughs> um, and anyway, so I have been, I've had this company, it's my company. Uh, we've been in business for almost 27 years now. Um, I, I got a, my education at the University of Tennessee, was in industry, the retail fertilizer farm supply business as an agronomist for 15 years, wholesale for f almost five years. And then I have been here with Azag Systems for like I said, going on 27 years. We work with approximately 40 farming operations in 15 states. Um, so we're impacting approximately a quarter million acres, about 250,000 acres ballpark. Uh, we just work with uh, grow growers who want to really try to improve yields, increase efficiency, increase productivity. Perfect. So uh, 27 years ago is when you got out of the fertilizer, retail, wholesale side of things and decided to go independent, correct? Correct. So um, Paul has spent um, Paul spent a long time developing a database and a system um, for not only measuring uh, tissue samples and identifying what's most limiting, but also um, all kinds of other things. So like I mentioned earlier, I've learned so much from Paul. Uh, one of the things that, that I notice with Paul is um, he will see things in the field that other people do not see. And we talked about on the phone earlier today um, how it, it's unbelievable how many agronomists and sales reps walk out in a field and say, oh, this looks perfect, looks beautiful. And Paul walk out there and he's like, oh, this is this is anthracnose. Oh, this is a SCN. This is midge. This is, you know, there's all these things out there. So uh, attention to detail um, is one thing, but you have to know what you're even looking for to, to have attention to detail, right? So that's something that, that Paul brings to the table that, that so far we we haven't met any other agronomists that that bring that that are close to that level. So um, so anyway, um, the the thing I want to talk about first is um, the importance of agronomy. Um, and, and just like I alluded to, agronomy is complex. There's a lot of variables in growing crops. There's a lot of variables in increasing yields. Um, there's a there's a global supply. Um, you know, there's a big demand for for food and uh, and affordable food, right? So, Paul, if you wouldn't mind, um, you have a graph that you've shown before. Um, could you maybe explain to us um, how the how the how the commodities and the inputs have changed over the years, and what we're looking at now, and what it takes to be successful as a farming operation? Yeah, Cody, the, the, the two graphs that we show when I start a meeting with growers is, or in a conversation with new clients is, number one, since 1900, according to the USDA, the price that we are getting for our production, both animals and grain crops, commodity crops, 
has been going down in terms of real dollars. And as that has happened, the world population has gone up. We crossed 8 billion people last fall, fall of 2022. And I, my claim is that these, this population couldn't go up without these prices coming down. So the need for us to be efficient as producers, not only do we have to produce the food, but it's gotta be economical for people to buy it. And we've gotta be productive to where we can make a profit knowing that the price is going down. Now the price has been dropping uh, almost a percent a year average since 1900. Fortunately, our productivity, again, according to the USDA, has been going up by about one and a half percent. So we're, we're on a treadmill just barely staying ahead. So the key is always, 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 we've got to get more. We've got to squeeze out more. Now, fortunately, there's a lot of room to do that. Mm-hmm. So not only is it producing the crops, but producing the crops economically so where the guys producing it, our farmers, can make money to reinvest and keep the business profitable, but also that people can buy it. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be, remain to be the challenge. Now, the second graph I show is that how where does the yield come from, the different components? And this is a very nice graph the USDA provides also. And it was showing like in the 70s, how much of the yield increase came from an addition of inputs. Mm-hmm. And that's the model that a lot of people run against agriculture, commercial production agriculture. Oh, they're using all this stuff, they're using all this stuff. And since the 70s and going into the uh, 2011 to 2020 period, the graph shows how much more of it is all about management. Mm-hmm. And you can't buy a big crop. You just cannot buy a big crop. Uh, that's what the USDA is saying. That's what we really encourage growers. Everybody's on a budget. We've got to make this stuff happen. And where do we invest that dollar to get the, the higher return, the better return, the more profitable return? If you can't, you cannot, absolutely cannot sacrifice yields. Yields cannot go down. This thing about, well, we can cut back and we'll have a little bit less yield, but it's more. No. No, you can't go on that road. You can't go down that road. You have got to keep having this incremental increase in productivity. At least that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Sure. So one thing as far as efficiency and productivity goes and and maintaining and raising yields and ROI, um, there's there's only so much land. Um, You know, there's only so much water there. there's a lot of dry land farmers that don't have the ability to water their crops so as far as raising yields and profitability goes how important do you think it is uh for farmers um and and agronomists and and salesmen for that matter to do a better job at at getting educated um on agronomic principles and and details about agronomy because from what i've seen there's a huge gap a huge knowledge. There's no shortage of salesmen and products, but there's a huge shortage of, of education and knowledge. And a lot of that's just, why would you educate yourself? You know, it's hard work. Um, you know, what's what's the incentive? But in your opinion, how important is that uh, for, for people to start taking agronomy and facts about agronomy more seriously and getting more educated? Good question. I am. Um... I, you can tell people are not prepared simply by the, the way that they run it, the problem. Most people in agriculture, production agriculture, real crop production agriculture, mm-hmm. think we have to add to get more. Yep. And basic agronomy says, no, to get more, you do less. Mm-hmm. You don't add things, you remove things. And what you're trying to identify is what's the most limiting factor. Mm-hmm. Does that, okay, does that make sense? Let me let me go on. You only get a response to any kind of input if you've removed the most limiting factor. If you put 100 pounds extra nitrogen out there, but you don't get weed control, it isn't going to do anybody any good because the weeds are going to outcompete whatever crop you're trying to grow. If you are have all these plans to do great things with your crop, but you have a disease that you don't recognize or somebody doesn't recognize, um, that disease is going to limit what kind of response you're going to get for any additional input. So 
The key to getting higher yields is not addition, it's subtraction. And what you're subtracting is the most limiting factor. And the only way to identify what that limiting factor is, that I know of anyway, is first of all, being in the field during the season. Mm -hmm. Um, It's identifying uh, what you're seeing. Uh, We have access, and it's an important role that the land grants do play still, especially in the disease labs, because most of us are not trained pathologists to understand diseases. Mm -hmm. We have good entomologists. Uh, For example, this tar spot that's taken over a lot of, uh, raising a lot of angst, uh, rust on corn for late planted crops. As this heat comes up, uh, we're getting into a a, claim, uh, a changing climate. How does that impact uh, the crop that we're growing? How does that impact the different components? And so for me, agronomy is, first of all, understanding the different components of yield mm-hmm. for any crop that you're trying to grow, first of all, and then identifying where you're falling short of that yield component, and then what could possibly cause that. Sure. So next, so you, the agronomy part, we're, we're like the GPs of the medical field. We're like the GPs. So we have to know nutrition, and plant nutrition remains number one obstacle for most people. Mm-hmm. No, no question about that. Um, then we have to be, obviously, some degree of uh, experience in pathology, identifying some diseases, what's causing them, Mm-hmm. Uh, how to avoid them, how to prevent them. Uh, then there's in- insects. We have to be entomologists. We also have to be somewhat, <laughs> you know, uh, meteorologists to understand what the weather is doing and where it's changing. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a there's a multi there's a multi uh, skill level of some basic skill level. So agronomy. We talk about agronomy. Um, so I'm a plant physiologist by training. So I'm going to look at nutrition, weather, abiotic stress first, mm-hmm. and then I'm going to look for nem- I'm going to look for nematodes. I'm going to look for insects. I'm going to look for diseases second to try to identify and remove those limiting factors. And I think that's the biggest thing about agronomy that maybe people miss. I don't know that. That's just what my observation is. Sure, I would agree completely. I mean, the mentality that I had. Um, before I met you was uh, we add things to add yield, right? Like I I have this product, I should be able to go add it at a quart or two per acre or a pint or a gallon, whatever. Um, If I add this to my program, I should add five or 10 or 15 bushels, right? Like that's the mentality. That's the thought process, Um, yeah. Yeah, and when we started working with you and you started explaining all this, I was like, holy. Well, the way you interrupted for a second, the farmers farmers make fun of that. Well, this – my supplier was here today. He said, if I use this product, I'm going to get five bushels more. If I use this, I'll get three bushels more. If I add this and use this, next thing I know, I'm up to 500 bushels. Yeah. Unfortunately, it never happens. Yeah, like, right. Really. But at that thing, everybody's going to add to get more, and it just doesn't ever seem to work that way. Right. Yeah. But, hey, just try it again next year. Just keep doing it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it must have been a fluke. Do you maybe no, that's more? What I, the, the really good salespeople, it's gravity, man. It's the gravity. The gravity wasn't right this year. <laughs> yeah, they don't. Yeah, farmers don't know. You gotta, you gotta hold uh, your tongue out of the right side of your mouth when you're dumping it in the tank to get that yield increase. That's so right. That's little tricks of the trade. Um, okay, so um, moving forward a little bit, um, we talk a lot about soil health. Um, we'll talk a lot about it on this podcast. Obviously, the, our company name is ROI Biologicals, so we talk a lot about biology. And biologicals, but um, I I was in school in you know the the early two thousands um, in college learning plant microbe interactions and learning about microbiology. Um, you were what seventies, correct? In the seventies? Oh yeah, early seventies. Okay, so um, uh, fill me in on what they what the, what the discussion was in college and how much emphasis they put on it. You know, was it just a class talk about it a little bit and move forward? Um, how, how was that, um, back in the day, so to speak? <laughs> <laughs> well, when, um, when Thomas Jefferson and I were going to school together, it was yeah. a different game altogether. <laughs> um, no, we, we were taught, you know, I had, a, you know, I was, uh, university of Tennessee college of agriculture, uh, plant and soil science. 
Mm-hmm. My physiology was my major. I almost had a minor in soil microbiology. We were taught about the bacteria and the fungi. They existed. Obviously, we were using inoculants on soybeans, the Brady rhizobia, so we knew about that. Mm-hmm. Um, we were just never taught about how to manage it. And when you think about that, we we really hadn't broken over a hundred bushel average on corn. I forget what year that was, but it was getting close to that time. I mean, corn yields weren't weren't where they are today. Right. Actually, I don't know what that number was back then, but and there was um There was a difference on how farm it is. So there really, we weren't taught that much about how to manage with it. To answer your question specifically, mm-hmm. but you think about where it was. What were farmers doing back then? Well, what was, the, farmers has always farming has always been about managing risk. Mm-hmm. You with me? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, how did you manage risk? Well, you diversified. So almost every farm, the average size farmer wasn't. You only needed 300 acres to support one person. Today, that number is over 1,100 acres. I'm not sure what that number is anymore exactly like I used to, but it's it was over it was 300 versus acres versus 1,100. So almost everybody had made a little bit of vegetables, a little bit of tobacco. Almost everybody had animals, right? Mm-hmm. You had um, grasses, hay. So you were rotating. This was something that you did because you had four, five, six. And I call them enterprises on every farm. Sure. Okay, and maybe somebody was selling seed, or somebody, one of your family members was, you know, uh, was cutting wood. They had whatever, so it was managing risk by diversification, right? Crop rotation, um, small acres broken up. Over here, where I am, it was vegetables. Just everybody had four, five, six acres of vegetables, or tobacco, mm-hmm. or peanuts. Then government steps in. It has this thing called crop insurance. It says, we're going to mitigate risk because one of the downsides of diversification is that you lose efficiency, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we're in, I'm from, I live in Virginia now. And uh, in Virginia, they said the only, the only man that um, could do more than two things really well was Thomas Jefferson. And he's not, he ain't farming today. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, so. Right. So most most of us can only do one or two things really really well. Thomas Jefferson could do a bunch. We all agree on that. But anyway, so if I'm a good tomato farmer, I'm probably not that good a wheat farmer. If I'm a wheat, really good wheat farmer, maybe I'm not a good tobacco farmer. But mm-hmm. uh, and then I've got these cows and I've got these pigs and chickens and so the government steps in and says we will take the risk by having this thing called crop insurance. So especially in the '80s, it says if you get in trouble, we're going to help you out. We're, so we're going to eliminate the need for you to diversify to spread your risk out. We're going to assume that risk. Okay. You with me? Yes. So then all of a sudden farms explode. You can, now you have farms that, you know, thousands and thousands of acres, a lot of times corn after corn after corn after corn, uh, or soybeans. Um, we had bigger, bigger equipment, bigger tillage, bigger numbers. We really didn't have herbicides, Cody, until really in the mid seventies. We had two, four D and atrazine, uh, lasso came out. In the early 70s, Dual came out. You know, the metolachlor, mm-hmm. acetochlor compounds came out, I want to say in the, in the uh, late 70s. Mm-hmm. Then we had this explosion of all these herbicides. Excuse me. Um, and then we got more familiar with fungicides, and then we got insecticides. And and that that pushed the yields up. The, the breeders have always given us more. Paul, Paul isn't genetic- that a- isn't that a perfect example uh, of most limiting factors? You know, we know spraying Roundup and atrazine on crops doesn't raise the yield, right? But removing right. the weeds as a limiting factor allows those Shock yields to oh, drag higher, right? Corn yields, when, when Roundup Ready crops came out in 96, yields just have just shot up since then. Yeah, so when somebody asks me, well, what do you mean I don't get to add something and raise yield? It's like, okay, let me. that's the best example I can come up with is, well, when Roundup Ready beans came out, everybody looked like a – a dang good bean farmer, right? It's not because you sure. spray Roundup on your beans and gain twenty bushels. It's because you remove the weeds as a limiting factor. Finally, so correct. I just sorry to interrupt. I just thought no, no, you're you know, exactly that's, that's the best analogy I can come up with for people to to you know to maybe understand a little bit more about what we mean. So anyway, the, there was so, a boom of boom of of chemistry. Uh, weed control was finally 
happening. Fine, and that, that pushed the yields up, and then we got bigger equipment. We had crop insurance, where that all that meant you can't get you're not going to get rich with crop insurance. Uh, but here in the East Coast, the Mid Atlantic, crop insurance has been a godsend for us because you get to live to fight another day, even when you have a disaster like a drought. Mm-hmm. Drought with the drought that we had in '83 almost wiped out everybody. By the time we had that drought in 2012 with crop insurance, it was bad, but it, we got something. Right, and we, we we didn't get we didn't go out of business, and so those you know, so these, are, these are things I never understood. You know, when you talk about oh, the government took the risk, um, took the risk out of it, so now you can be more efficient as a grower. Like I, I just never that never crossed my mind. <laughs> you know, crop insurance. Well, that's how they, that's how farming. That's how it was. It was diversification to to, to spread out. It was managing risk by diversification. Government wow. said, you know what, we're losing efficiency by diversifying. Sure. We're not capable of that. We're going to take. We're going to help manage. We're going to help manage not all the risk, obviously. Right. But then you know you get to, now you still you know you still have guys raising sweet potatoes or potatoes or they still have you know usually two or three crops, but that's it of vegetables now. Right. So that has changed everything. Mm-hmm. And then we throw. So then then the the use of manures and go back to the point I was trying to make earlier. The biggest problem by far and away is nutrition. Now, we just assume, looking at a soil sample, that that nutrition, that plant is going to be balanced, and it's not. So that's when we started getting into the tissue sampling thing, which you alluded to earlier, Mm -hmm. to find out how balanced are these nutrients. Because a lot of this behavior, how a crop behaves to responds, has got to do with nutrition, just like it would be with you and me. Right. Okay. Uh, Every doctor you go to will tell you, watch what you're eating. Stay away from the salt, the sugar, and the fat, right? Right. Of which I do none of. <laughs> so, so what I'm saying, so what I'm saying, that's that's what's changed in my mind. I'm not saying that's the only thing, but in my mind, where I'm sitting, watching the whole thing go through since basically since 1970, you know, watching this whole thing go through. Um, so we've been out, we've been getting to it. Uh, you know, it'll be 50 years for me actually actually being involved here pretty soon. Right. Um, in 2025, I'll be 50 years doing this. And that's what that's what, the way I look at it. See, so now it's about dealing with this, you know, the, the big equipment, the lack of rotation in some fields, the, 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 the herbicides mm-hmm. that we're using. All those things are have changed a lot of things. Right. Right. Yep. That, uh, um, one of the things on, um, one of the things I want to touch on a little bit, uh, is just, you know, following that, that same trail weed and pest management. Um, so, um, IPM integrated pest management is something we learned about in college. Um, they talk about it and, um, you know, I just, I feel like, I feel like people a lot of times, don't understand really in depth um why why we do what we do in agriculture so you know there's a there's a huge um demonization of glyphosate for instance right and it's like okay well maybe maybe it's terrible i don't know um you know but um but we have to know why we're doing things right i mean we don't just buy stuff for fun you know but but can you can you walk us through um through your perspective of I, your your perspective of IPM um, and some of the key things that you see um, being missed in let's just go with soybean production. Let's just for instance soybean production. What are what are a couple things that that you see not happening? People not not addressing. Uh, we talk about root health. We talk about seed treatments. We talk about disease ide- identification. What's just one or two things that you see a lot of that nobody else seems to be talking about? Well, on soybeans specifically, um, we've noticed we've done tissue samples since 1982, um, just because it was the one soil samples varied by lab, mm-hmm. depending on where you went, but the tissue sample supposedly was done exactly the same way in every lab. So that gave us an idea about nutrition. Right. We've noticed in the last 15, 18 years, the iron levels in soybean plants, we're actually in a whole lot of crops has dropped. Mm-hmm. Now, 
Is that because varieties and genetics have changed? Is it because we stopped burning coal in the Midwest so we're we're not getting that free sulfuric acid that that sulfur anymore that was lowering the pH of the rain? Mm -hmm. Is it because of Roundup that was a chelating agent, the first patent? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know why, but it is. And so iron is a good example of Cercospora in soybeans is basically an iron deficiency. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. So we see Cercospora and the textbooks will tell you or the recommendation will tell you to spray a fungicide, but the fungicide is pretty ineffective. So if you have Cercospora in a field or you know you have Cercospora, uh, number one, you can get some varieties that are resistant. Unfortunately, most of those varieties are the group five beans and up. Because mm -hmm. it's more of a southern issue, but there are some guys in the Midwest, the southern Midwest, to the as now as the, your temperatures are going up where you guys are, y'all might see it too. But anyway, so we know that Cercospora is caused by a fungus that lives in the soybean plant that steals the plant's iron. So as long as the soybean plant can extract enough iron out of the soil, uh, everybody's fine. But as soon as the iron struggles. And everybody says, well, we've got plenty of iron in our soils. That's not an issue for us. I said, wait, 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 stop right there. Mm -hmm. Most of the iron that we have in our soils is in the trivalent form, a plus three. Mm -hmm. Plants can only use it as a plus two. Most organisms can only use it as a plus two. There are organisms that do use plus three iron effectively and efficiently. Unfortunately, we're not raising those crops. Mm-hmm. So how do we get the iron available? The soybean plants are not very good at getting of iron out of the soil, reducing that iron from a plus three to a plus two. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we have to help it. So we know some varieties are better at it than others, mm -hmm. but then we know that we have to do uh, some things to help it. Right. So the obvious answer to get back to your question about IPM is that you've got Cercospora, spray it with a fungicide, even though we all say the fungicides really do, don't do that good a job. So we have, in this case, we know that that is really, an iron is contributing to that. We know that target spot on tobacco, mm -hmm. they say, well, spray with a fungicide. That's an iron deficiency. Mm -hmm. Okay, we know uh, the certain diseases, plants are more prone to be susceptible to diseases with imbalanced nutrition, unbalanced nutrition. I can tell you one thing, if you look at some of the crops, uh, too much nitrogen fertilizer is a cause of a lot of diseases, especially bacterial diseases. Sure. Okay. Yep. And then the IPM in the, in the terms of insects, a lot of times the insects are attracted to plants that are not nutritionally balanced. Sure. And again, excessive nitrogen is part of that. So we're telling people to spray for insecticides. The IPM concept is, is insects are the easy one. When you are out there with your sweep nets and you get so many insects per 15 sweeps or per 20 sweeps or per 10 sweeps, mm -hmm. if you catch so many insects at this stage of growth, you the recommendation is to spray right. an insecticide on that plant to knock those population back. So the downside to that is you, a lot of times you're knocking back the beneficial insects too. Sure. Yep. So even some land grants now, two of them, particularly uh, Missouri, Mississippi and Arkansas, I think, both said that for us to put insecticides where they're not needed, just to throw it in the tank because we're making a trip can actually lower soybean yields. Yeah, and that's a big that's a big thing, right? I mean, I I, I can't tell you how many people I hear say, "Well, I'm going out there anyways. It's only three bucks. I'm gonna stick it in the tank." It's, only, it's cheap, and the pyrethroids have dropped it so much. Sure, but you know, you know so there's there's a combination of things going on here. It's number one, not knowing the true root cause of the issue, right? right. And then there's another one of not knowing the full effect of what we're putting out, right? Like not knowing the off-target damage and what that means long term i think you're right you know yeah that's 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 part of the part of the issue that's why it really you have to have something to ask your question why we worry about agronomy to have that background have that knowledge you, you know i'm not an entomologist but i know enough about bugs and how it works to help make the farmer make that decision sure i'm not a, i'm not a plant pathologist 
but I know enough about pathology to help the farmer make that decision. You know, a, a cause and effect, sure. weigh the differences, weigh the recommendations. When do we do this and when don't we do this? Sure. And that, you know, that the, the root cause is probably what it all boils down to, to me, you know, uh, as we've worked with you over the years, um, it, it's, that's always the objective, right? Is to find out what's the root cause of this. Like we don't want to treat Absolutely. symptoms. If we have to treat a symptom, I guess we will, but we don't want to, we want to treat root problem. causes, you know, and yep. another yep. piggybacking on the iron thing. It's like, Oh, uh, we have phosphorus issues. We need more phosphorus. And, and you've told us before, well, a lot of times a phosphorus issue is a root health issue, not a phosphorus issue, right? It's right. a phosphorus mm-hmm. availability issue because of a lack of root health. So, um, that's been, or another, just to interrupt you for a second, the other thing is seed depth. If you're planting your corn too shallow and mm-hmm. you get some chilly weather in there, you're going to see low phosphorus levels on your tissue sample. You don't need more phosphorus. You need to get your dadgum seed down at the right depth. Is that, you know, <laughs> right. Right. So, so there's those are the things that we try to uh, bring to people's attention, educate them as, as to what they're doing and what we're looking at. Sure. Yeah. And that... Yeah, exactly. So that, you know, spending money on symptoms is, is not a great strategy, right? Um, but, but spending money to address root causes usually is a very solid strategy. All right, thank you guys for joining in on that. And I'm, I'm so glad that you got to hear from Paul Bodenstein. He's been a great resource and he's a knowledge of wealth for us um, to be able to access and work with. So uh, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you guys are interested in learning more about what we do and how we work, if you're interested in working together, please just go to our website, ROIbiologicals.com, um, and go to the Contact Us page and shoot us an email or find us on Facebook and send us a message. Um, someone will get back with you shortly. So thanks again for listening. And remember, if you want to learn more or work with us, just go to ROIbiologicals.com or look us up on Facebook and send us a message. Thanks. Thanks.